Okay. Uh, now, a few uh, sessions back, we briefly touched on um, NF tables and the fact that NF tables re was replacing uh, IP tables. Uh, now, <clears throat> net filtering. Uh, okay, we, we've we've covered briefly uh, prior to this the structure of uh, net file tables. We've also covered briefly uh, the basic idea of um, packet switching networks. So you should now have a at least a rudimentary grasp of um, how data packets are seen by the Linux operating system. And from there, uh, we can build on that to see how these uh, net filters are working. Uh, now, uh, try to remember what the uh, correct key sequence is. Uh, um, I suppose it helps if you're actually active. And here we go. Right. Now, this is a, a very useful uh, website, uh, the wiki nftables.org. Uh, nftables.org, of course, being the place where <coughs> nftables uh, is really developed and defined. And this is their wiki. So we'll start here. Now, uh, the, the first thing we really want to look at is tables. Uh, I've got it on the change page here because uh, we're going to move on very rapidly. Uh, as I said, the tables are really just a, a convenient way of organizing chains. Uh, <clears throat> so let's uh, let's just quickly go through this page. Uh, okay, uh, let's just look at this. Let's look at the table first. Okay, so the table here, okay, um, what you've got here is a table uh, which this is the type of the table, uh, INET, which basically means it's going to be uh, processing IP packets, uh, both uh, of, of type IP4 and of type IP6. We're really only concerned with IP4 uh, at the moment. Uh, we'll look at IP6 later because it's, a, a, it's, a, it's both simpler and more complicated. Um, <laughs> so IP4 is the one that you're most likely to come across. Uh, it's the one that you'll see with the four octets. So you've got the, you know, the, the uh, for example, uh, your local home network will be something like 192.168.0 some number, or 192.168.1 and some number. Uh, if you're if you're uh, concerned about running out of uh, the 255 times 255 possible IP addresses, you might want to use 10 dot something on your internal network. Um, if you're a large organization, chances are you're using either a 10 uh, subnet or you're using some you know, subnet that you uh, defined your up. It doesn't matter internally, uh, really, uh, what your IP range is, uh, other than uh, you can make routing a real son of a bitch if you're not careful. Uh, because you'll end up conflicting with IP addresses of uh, real organizations out on the internet. So it's best to stick to the internal IP address ranges that are designed to be used within a network, within a, a local area network. Anyway, off the, off the point. Uh, so this is, so what this table is telling us is that it is uh, an internet packet type. This is just the name of the, uh, of the table. And this can be anything you like, uh, as long as it's, uh, I think it's limited to, uh, I don't know if it's limited to uh, ASCII characters A through Z. Uh, maybe maybe you can put numbers in there, but whatever. Uh, the point is, it's, it's pretty much freeform. No spaces.
if you're coming from the IP tables world, then uh, you'll see that this is in lowercase. There's no reason why it should be. It can be in uppercase. Um, and uh, your default table, uh, uh, I think is is called, uh, what is the default IP table? I can't, I can't remember now. Uh, not that it really matters. Um, it, it may even be filter. Totally irrelevant for what we're talking about. Anyway, so yeah, yes, so that's a table. So you really, all, all a table encapsulates is the type and its name. The rest of the content is these chains. Now, chains come in broadly, well, in two types. Uh, there are base chains, and there are not base chains. <laughs> base chains are designed uh, or intended to be attached to hooks within the kernel packet uh, uh, processing uh, system uh, and they, they come in one of these three different flavors and this really just tells the system what the chain is intended to do okay so the first type is the most common one that we're going to be using for a firewall which is filter uh, which uh, imaginatively enough um, is for filtering so really just for accepting dropping rejecting packets uh, root uh, right this is uh, for uh, rewriting the packet as it passes through your net filter tables system uh, That's kind of advanced use, <laughs> as far as we're concerned. Uh, from a firewall point of view, uh, it's uh, not really something we're going to use on the firewall. So uh, we won't use the root, root uh, chains on our firewall, uh, but it is something that we will probably use later on when we're looking at uh, you know, redirecting stuff onto for example, uh, virtual lands within our network setting. Uh, so there, there are, there are, there's stuff we could do with it. NAT is kind of a special version of root. Uh, it's uh, NAT is short for network address translation. Uh, and it is really for uh, for packets that are moving across network boundaries uh, and most commonly let's take let, let, let's deal with a home network okay so within your home network you may have one or more networks within your home network um, but the point is that at some point there will be a boundary between your uh, local area network for your home and the internet at large now the fact that you've got say four computers on your home network and they will have four IP addresses on the, on the local network but those addresses are not suitable to be presented to the world at large okay in actual fact um, your uh, you know cable modem or whatever will have an IP address assigned usually by your ISP uh, uh, and that will be the single address by which your entire network uh, needs to communicate with the internet at large And that presents a problem because uh, if you think about it uh, you've got a, a packet generated by a computer down here that's requesting something from youtube okay uh, so the packet goes across the boundary but it can't it can't have a return address which is say 192.168.1.1 or whatever you know at the, the address of the machine because if you did that it would conflict with everybody else's uh, local area network machines so at some point some part of your system has to keep track of uh, packets as they cross that boundary and they become packets that are addressed by the external address of your uh, of your uh, isp uh, okay uh, this is probably best if i draw this out uh, let me just uh, switch to the document camera right um, okay so the situation is this you've got a boundary okay and on this side of it 
we'll call this your LAN. So this is this is your home home network down here. Uh, and let's say you've got you know, PC one, PC two, and PC three. Just just for the sake of argument. Okay. And this one's address is one nine two one six eight one ten. And this one is one nine two one six eight one dot twenty. And this one is one nine two one six eight dot one dot thirty. Okay, so so far so good. There's no there's no problem there. Now Fred blogs down the road. He also has a LAN. Okay, and here's TV, yeah, interactive TV. He's given it address 192.168.1.30. Okay, which obviously is going to conflict with your PC if these two networks uh, are not differentiated somehow. Now, over here is Google at 216 something 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 their IP address okay is a is a 216 whatever address okay uh, so there's there's some machine out here that belongs to Google uh, which is addressed you know, with a, a 216 uh, leading up tap okay now both you and Joe Blow okay will have some device uh, typically uh, a router of some description uh, uh, a cable modem or uh, you know, a wireless router box or whatever uh, that will be supplied by your ISP okay and your ISP will have given this some uh, IP address okay so this will be you know uh, I, I don't know 18585 dot 10 dot Seventeen. Okay, so just a, an IP address assigned by your ISP. Okay, and Joe Blow will have a similarly unique address. Okay, so his address will be you know, ninety-seven dot one dot fifteen dot seventeen. Okay, so your 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 uh, presence on the internet is identified by this IP address and Joe's is identified by this IP address. So let's consider a packet coming from PC3. All right, it reaches this router here. Okay, so it's it's on its way from your LAN out to Google. Now it can't keep its 192.168.130 address. Uh, as as the return address, if you like, uh, of of the packet, because if it does, then when Google sees one nine two one six eight one dot thirty, where does it send it? Uh, there's nothing to differentiate your PC three from Joe Blow's TV uh, or anybody else's one nine two one six eight one dot thirty, and that is where NetJS translation comes in. And there, there are several forms of translating these addresses. Uh, the most common is this NAT, okay, and it's uh, also referred to as masquerading. So what happens? Basically, what happens is the packet coming from this machine, okay, will have a source address of 192.168.1.30. And as it comes across this boundary here, the packet will be rewritten. Okay, so this device here will have the uh, NAT uh, system on it, and it will rewrite this source address. Okay, so it's now 185.85.10.17. In other words, it looks like this packet has come from this point here on the internet. So it goes off to Google, okay? Google does whatever and sends a packet back. And the destination address of that packet will be this address here, which is unique on the whole internet. Right? Uh, so it can be routed through whatever set of systems and it will eventually arrive back at uh, this thing here, right? Now, the NAT system has been keeping track, 
Okay, it knows that this reply packet uh, was originally 192.168.1.30 uh, and is now uh, this. Okay, so it looks at the destination address of the returning packet, which obviously will be this, and it then rewrites it as 192.168.130 and passes it onto the internal network, which then gets correctly routed to your PC3. So far, so simple. So the question now is, well, hang on a minute. How does it know uh, which packets coming into this input address okay, are destined for 1.30? Every packet coming back here will have a destination address of 10.17. Yeah, so what, yeah, why is it that it knows? And the answer is uh, connection tracking. Uh, it, it knows which packets are related to which. Okay, so it knows that outgoing packet one uh, is going to come back identified as the corresponding packet belonging to one. Right? Uh, so it knows how to map them back uh, to this address. We will come to that later. Okay, so with that very brief divergence, uh, which is probably more than we need to know about NAT at the moment because we're not going to be doing any NATing at the moment. We're just looking at protecting our internal server. So, firewall. So that's the three types of, of table. Okay, so there's the, the filter, the root, and the uh, NAT table. Okay, now this is what uh, where base chains are different from ordinary chains. Okay, base chains are attached to hooks within the um uh packet handling system within the Linux kernel. And these are basically uh, the names of the hooks. They actually have <coughs> um, different names within the operating system itself. But for our purposes we'll stick to these names because they're the ones documented in the in the wiki. Okay. Now Remember, a packet has arrived at your network interface card as just a series of electric signals, and that has done the decoding into a block of data. Okay, and it comes into the uh, system and it hits this pre routing uh, or pre routing, uh, depending on whether you're British or American, uh, uh, and it hits this hook. Okay, now at this point, okay, no routing decision has been made by the the system handling this packet okay so let's say uh, this was your uh, your uh, Linux router box the packet is basically raw at this point it's just a packet that's coming it's a piece of data no routing decision has been made uh, so remember routing and uh, packet filtering are slightly different um, decision making systems so we don't know at this point, okay, if it's addressed to this machine or whether it's addressed to another machine. So, to, to give you an idea, um, let's just cut back to here again. So, uh, let me see, how do I illustrate this? Right, let's say this was our, uh, the Linux system we were concerned about. Okay, so the packets come in. Okay, now we don't know at this point whether the, uh, the, the, uh, the pre routing stage, we don't know whether the packet is intended for this box uh, or whether it's intended for another box on the network. Yeah, uh, all we know is that a piece of data has arrived. Uh, a block of data has arrived and uh, we're going to do something with it okay now what does that mean well it means that if you're pre-routing uh, you could use for example a root table to change the where the packet is going <clears throat> now in the old um IP tables, this used to be done by a thing called the mangle table. Uh, now, you could create a mangle table. Uh, uh, you know, you can create a table called mangle and put all of your root chains in there. So that, uh, that's pre-routing. Right. Uh, 
Right, input. Right, so at this point, uh, the routing decision has been made. So, um, you know, you've, you've run through the set of routing rules that say uh, if uh, the IP address matches this condition, then it should go to uh, this local machine or it can go to an interface to be forwarded on uh, to a gateway or to another machine. Okay. Uh, so we could put a hook in there and that is this is a very common hook to use we'll see in a moment for your firewall uh, now why not use pre-routing for your firewall well the answer is uh, at the input stage we know that the packet is intended for this machine and if you're putting up a firewall to protect this machine then it stands to reason that, that, that the input hook is a good place to connect into uh, otherwise uh, you know you're going to do a lot of processing for a start that you don't need to uh, with the pre-routing we can just say that ah, you know uh, ignore it forward it whatever okay the forwarding table again this happens after the system has taken the destination IP address and decided what's going to happen to it whether it's going to go to the local host or whether it's going to the uh, you know somewhere else on your land for example uh, and the basic difference between input and forward is that with input we know it's destined for this machine the machine doing the actual packet handling if it's forward then it's destined for an other machine that we know about in other words that we we've got a routing rule for but it's not us output uh, is a table to handle packets that are created by programs that we're running uh, in other words it's not something where a packet has come in from the network interface card and is going out of our system it's you know we're running a, a web server or whatever on our local machine packets from that application will go to the output hook first uh, post routing uh, again this is downstream of output is effectively the corresponding thing to the pre-routing coming into input okay so your output table is going to make decisions about packets coming out of the local machine uh, then there's going to be some kind of routing decision uh, and then we can catch with the post routing we can catch uh, uh, packets before they leave the local system but after the last routing decision has been made up uh, and finally uh, we've got this uh, specialist ingress uh, which is <laughs> which is between the network interface card decoding the sort of electronic signals but before it even reaches pre-routing uh, so that's kind of uh yeah that, that your, your packet really is raw when it hits ingress because right? it literally just come off the wire as it were uh, and your net filter system really has done nothing uh, uh, with it at the point of ingress okay so that's uh, yeah so th these are chain hooks so what's the relationship between uh, chains and chain hooks well the answer is if you look down here at this example you can see uh, they've created a chain here called SSH and this is the definition of the chain okay so this is the basic specification of the chain it's not a rule per se although this is a rule this strictly speaking this is the definition of what the uh, chain is so you can see is a type filter which is this filter up here okay so we know it's a filter today uh, we know it's a filter chain uh, and then we say right okay it is hooked into the input so it's hooked into this input processing so we know that this chain is intended to only apply these rules 
to packets that are destined for this machine. Uh, in shorthand, filter type filter hook input is basically uh, a firewall rule. Uh, it's a local host firewall rule uh, that's in, you know, for packets that are intended for this machine. Nice. Now, just to make things a bit more difficult, uh, in actual fact, we can use this for uh, uh, filtering for packets coming in on the landing group, acting as a gateway. But uh, ignore that for a second. Uh, I mean, it, th those packets are intended for this machine because this machine is going to forward them to other machines. But, uh, for the purposes of this exercise, type filter hook input is basically a host firewall. Now, priority. What's priority all about? Now, if you remember when we touched on these tables uh, a while ago, we said uh, that all the chains within a table are basically applied. Uh, sorry, no, I'll rephrase that. Not, not, no. All chains that are attached to a particular hook, okay, so, uh, you know, we've got a filter that's attached to the input hook. We've got another one down here, filter attached to an input hook. Now, all of those rules get run uh, whenever that hook is reached. So the packet hits the input hook, okay, so both rules in this chain and rules in this chain are going to be executed. So the question then is, well, okay, uh, but how do I make sure, for example, that the rules in the input chain are always run after the rules in the SSH chain? And that's where priority comes in. Okay, so priority allows you to force the order in which chains are applied for the same hook okay so uh, this is a this is a good example um, now before just before we move on uh, each chain will also have a default policy that is to say if a packet goes through all of the rules in a, in, in the chain okay uh, and none of those rules apply to it or more the point it's made it all the way through the rules yeah. uh, what is the default action of this chain okay so in essence this policy except is the last rule in the chain uh, which says if a package made it this far accept it all right but this is where we have to be careful uh, we've now got a second chain which is going to be applied because again it's a filter and it's on the input hook oh, there you are, okay and because it's priority one it's going to be run after the rules that are run on this ssh chain so uh, what's going to happen is uh, it's going to apply the rules yeah? so there are no rules on this chain but it does have a policy of drop so Although the packet is accepted by the SSH chain, if it's aimed at the SSH port, right, uh, the packet is dropped because of this default policy here on the input. Uh, sorry, on the uh, yeah, on the input chain. Uh, so you have to be a bit careful when you're writing these rules to know that the the, the packet is going to be it's not like these are all glued together as it were yeah the packet is literally run through the chain uh, and it will get a, a decision is it accepted is it forwarded is it rejected you know what's going to happen to the packet as it falls through these rules right now in this case okay the ssa is is being accepted by this rule kill but it will be dropped by this chain because this chain is applied second so the rule the, the, the ssh chain runs first okay and it runs through the rules and it says oh this packet is accepted because it's a uh, got a destination port which is the ssh which port uh, 22 okay uh, so this this accepts the packet but having reached the end of that chain and said yes this packet is acceptable 
uh, the system will then say, well, hang on a minute, I've got another input uh, chain. So I need to now take that packet and I need to run it against all the rules in this chain. So this is the second, it's as if nothing has been done so far. Okay, The packet has simply made it this far, if you like. Yeah. Uh, and so we reach this one and we basically apply the rules and we say, well, there are no rules, so there's nothing to apply here. So, so far, so good. But because it hasn't been explicitly accepted by this chain, we apply the default policy, which is throw it all the way. So you have to be a little bit careful when you're um, setting these things up. Oh, oh, you, you got down. I know. Come on then. This is interesting. Yeah, you'll notice that although a packet which is accepted in one chain yeah, uh, will, will continue to be processed by subsequent chains, yeah, a packet which is dropped doesn't get a second chance. Okay, so for example, if I moved, uh, and this is actually pointed out down here, if I change this priority uh, to minus one, in other words, this input would actually be run before uh, the SSH, then the packet would be dropped at this point and this rule would never ever be tested because the packet, if a packet is dropped, that's it. Uh, all bets are off. Uh, it doesn't bother processing anything further. Okay, so that's uh, yeah, so that's priority. Uh, this is for reference, really. This is the old, the old priorities which were defaulted on IP tables. A lot of stuff with IP tables was was just default decisions. Now, if you're using NF tables and NF tables only, and it's recommended not to mix the two, uh, but if you're using NF tables, uh, then. Uh, it's interesting. It, it was recommended not to mix NF tables and IP tables, but now IP tables is effectively translated to NF tables anyway. So I wonder if that admonition to not mix them still stands. Anyway, uh, yes, so the old IP table system, these were the default priorities for various uh, operations within the IP tables. Uh, you can use these as a guide. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, rules in your uh, sorry your um, NAT table uh, could be set with a priority of minus one hundred. Uh, you know, uh, connection tracking uh, uh, hook. You could give a priority of minus two hundred. Whatever. Okay, but just be aware that priority just sets the the order in which change are applied. Cool. Okay, uh, it's uh, now you've got the uh, the default policy. Now, now in NF tables, we have only accept and drop. They've got rid of reject, uh, so that's good because reject was pretty much never used. Uh, now, non-base chains, right? Why would you need? A non-base chain. Right, remember, a base chain is a chain which is associated with a hook like this. Okay, and these hooks up here. Right. Uh, now, remember, these hooks basically allow you to connect a chain to uh, the operation of the net filter system. So, why would you need a chain which isn't attached to a hook? because surely then that chain would never be executed. And the answer is, yeah, it could be. Um, for example, uh, you could have a chain, a set of rules, which were about, uh, say, logging uh, packets. Okay. 
Uh, and rather than set those uh, rules, which were about logging packets uh, on every single uh, chain that you're associating with, for example, input or with forward or with output, without input and output, yeah. So rather than uh, individually logging, uh, what you could do is you could have one set of logging rules which you would put into a chain, uh, which was not a base chain because you're not associating it with the hook. But within the input and output, you can jump to that table and have that table then return. It's like a subroutine. But it's a set of rules that you might want to apply uh, repeatedly uh, to, to different parts of your uh, uh, filtering or your routing or whatever. Uh, so it gives you a good concise way of organizing commonly used rules, let's put it that way. Yeah. Or just to declutter a table because you might, you might find the table gets very very cluttered uh, you know, as you get lots and lots of rules these tables can get quite big and cumbersome uh, in large organizations. So rather than you know, create a, you know, a thousand rules that all get put into one great big chain, you can create uh, you know, rules for area A on my uh, network, area B, area C. Uh, you can create uh, chains which are particularly designed for a, an application's traffic. You, know, and you can put those within their own isolated chain you don't associate them with a particular uh, hook and then within the chain which is associated with the hook you just have a rule which will trigger more detailed rules uh, and then jump to that table uh, jump to that chain sorry uh, so that's the value of non-base chains uh. <laughs> Think of them as, uh, um, yeah, subroutines really. And they're sets of rules that can be called upon Okay, so that's that's it really. That I mean, that's all there is to it. Uh, so we've now got the two pieces of. Uh, of the puzzle. Uh, on the one hand, we looked at uh, very broadly, we looked at uh, the structure of packets. And if you remember a packet uh, roughly speaking uh, is a series of headers which are nested. Okay, so you've got at the top level Everything is called the uh, what was it? What was it called? The frame, uh, uh, and then within that you've got another group, which again has its own head. So you just knock the frame header off, and you're left with uh, yeah the uh, what is it? The, the uh, network header, and then you've got the, or the link header, and you've got the uh, network header, and you've got the application header and you've got the actual data that you really want yeah so you've got that uh, that series of, of headers that, that you gradually knock off the header uh, as you go through the processing but the point is there's lots of information buried in those headers uh, uh, ooh, can't remember what was, uh, did I have it sitting around anywhere uh, I can't remember where we got to actually. Uh, so you've got a series of yeah, you've got a series of headers uh, with a load of data, like for example the source address, the destination address, what ports it is addressed it addressed to, you know that that kind of stuff. Uh, and that these blocks of data are going to be presented to the network uh, filter table, and the main thing you have to control it um, is the definition of these rules mm -hmm. and these rules are grouped into these chains 
Okay, so you've got the rules, which are grouped into chains, which are organized by tables. Uh, and in actual fact, this is a good example of the kind of rule that we are going to set up. And that is, uh, we're going to set up a filter table, which is our INET packets, so packets, our normal IP, IP packets. Uh, and uh, we're going to create rules which are for things like this, which is you know, if you've got a destination port coming in, which is destined for our SSH, then we allow it. Uh, and we're going to have to do that for things that are on our uh, Ethernet zero. If we're working with a vagrant machine, uh, you know, we, we, need, we need packets to traverse Ethernet zero uh, because that's how Vagrant talks to the box. Uh, so everything we're looking at at the moment here, on, on, uh, uh, so everything on here is all passing across that boundary because we are SSH'd into the box um, via the Vagrant SSH command. Uh, and all the traffic is going to be passing through here. Uh, remember that this interface is our own private internal network, which is internal to VirtualBox in this case. Uh, and at the moment, we've got nothing passing over this interface. Well, there'll be, there'll be stuff leaking out if we've uh, got things attached to all interfaces. Uh, uh, okay, so you can see here we've got the things that are attached to all the interfaces uh, we've got the SSH daemon so uh, we can SSH between server 1 and server 2 uh, these two uh, are our salt system uh, 4505 and 4506 these are the port numbers but again they're bound to all the interfaces that's what these 000 is okay you, 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 uh, Zero, zero, zero is. We're bound to all the interfaces. Same with the SSH daemon, it's bound to all the interfaces. Uh, uh, this 111 is the init system, uh, which is the uh, system startup. Uh, then we've got uh, these are IP6 addresses. Again, the colon, colon, colon is everything. So we could use uh, IP4 or IP6 for our init or SHD. Then, <coughs> excuse me, you've got this DH client, which is the um, dynamic host addressing, uh, and that's running again, bound to all the interfaces uh, on port 68. Now, uh, why have we got uh, this again, 111, same as up here? And the answer is different protocols, okay? One's on TCP, the other one is UDP. Okay, so at the moment, there's not much running on our system, only what we expect, which is the SSH server, uh, SSHD. And then we've got these two Python processes, which are our salt master, uh, which is uh, using 4505 and 4506 uh, for various things. So what we want to do now, uh, there, there are several things we ought to do. Uh, one thing we ought to do is make sure that salt doesn't bind to all the interfaces. Uh, when we are on, a, on our real system, um, uh, on our system, okay, the salt master, uh, we're going to have multiple interfaces. Uh, I think on the server we do actually just have, uh, uh, I think we just have the, the, the one interface actually on the server, but let's say it's got two. Uh, so this one might be the, the managed LAN, and this one might be uh, attached to the WAN gateway. Okay, we do not want the salt master attached to this interface, but we do want it attached to this interface because the salt master will now talk to all of our minions. Uh, so minion one, minion two, 
million three, and they're all on the internal network. And then this one goes off to the gateway and onto the internet. By having salt not even attached to this interface, uh, we limit uh, the footprint, if you like, the, the exposure. Okay, uh, there's no way our salt system can be exposed to the world at large uh, through this link if it's not attached to it. Yeah, so at the moment, we're, we're being very promiscuous and we're attaching to all of the addresses. Okay, so at the moment, uh, we are actually attached to both interfaces. Uh, whereas what we really want is it to be attached to just the internal network. Same goes for our SSH. Uh, uh, it may be that in our final system, the opposite is true. Okay, so uh, our SSH, uh, so SSH, we, we may want to bind the SSH to the wide area network so that we can SSH into this machine, uh, but we don't want it bound to this one because we don't want any of our local machines to SSH back to the salt master, although we may want to SSH out. But, okay, we'll deal with that when we come to it. That's a, so again, uh, although it's convenient to just have everything binding to these uh, to every network uh, interface, from a security point of view, you really want to be much more selective. You want to say no, uh, you know, I'm going to limit the interfaces it can talk to, and and thereby uh, I can limit even who can connect into it. And so the same goes also, by the way, for uh, the remote addresses. At the moment, we're allowing anyone. To connect to these interfaces uh, and what we really want to do is limit it so for example we might want to limit it to only machines on our local network can connect to these ports at all right but we were talking about firewalls we're not talking about uh, we're not talking about um, uh, ports and port bindings Okay, now if we look at, um, I'm not going to remember now, what is it, NFT list, oops. Okay, so this, um, if I remember correctly, what happened was I was showing you the IP tables. Um, as soon as you run an IP tables command, uh, it creates these, uh, it, it immediately creates uh, IP, remember IP is IP4. Uh, filter table uh, and it creates the input board and the output chains uh, which are corresponding to the old IP tables uh, this one is hooked to the input hook okay and again going back to here uh, remember uh, our input hook uh, this one is connected to our forward hook Okay, that's the forward hook, and this one is connected to the output hook. And so this one's out. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well, why, why would I be bothered about packets going out? And the answer is, again, it's, it's all about security. You, you don't want information leaking uh, out from your system. Uh, a, it's not nice to you know, leak crap onto the uh, local area network, for example. And it's better to stop errant packets before they even get on the network. Um, so for example, uh, some systems are very noisy with uh, UDP traffic, which is only useful uh, in certain contexts. So you might, rather than trying to mitigate it by finding all the various bits of program that are leaking this stuff and sometimes you've got no choice because it's a fundamental part of your operating system uh, so what you might want to do is actually set output rules uh, which stop that crap from leaking onto the local area network or, or indeed onto the wide area network uh, so yeah so the output does have its uses uh, and the same goes for forwarding rules. Uh, 
it's it's quite conceivable that you have um, uh, packets passing through your system uh, that you you just want to stop. Now you can see here that the all of these have got a, a default accept policy. If I set the input to be default of uh, drop, then I would cut myself off from. <laughs> And if I cut myself off, that would be a bad thing because it would mean that this connection that I've got here uh, would suddenly not work because uh, all of the packets uh, being sent from my SSH client uh, would suddenly not work. Now, if you're working with a virtual system and you do you know, do something silly like cut yourself off, then there is a way around it. And that is... Uh, if I just uh, put my desktop up. Right, so if you were to be a lemon and cut yourself off, then what you can do is you can uh, start up your virtual box GUI, right? Uh, go to whichever machine it is you cut yourself off from which in this case is this central servo one. Okay, uh, and if you double click on that, you will open up this. Now, you might be thinking, well, hang on a minute, how come that doesn't get carved? Because surely that's just another SSH. This is your console. This is as if you had physically plugged into that machine. Uh, a monitor and a keyboard so this this doesn't rely on ssh this is literally the the, the console device uh, so this won't be cut off uh, and you'll be able to log in okay and you'll log in as the vagrant user uh, with the default password of vagrant okay and this allows you then to recover the situation because you'd be able to change the rule back so you weren't dropping all the packets uh, so it's not the end of the world if you do it on here. Uh, uh, it's not the end of the world if you cut yourself off uh, by making a mistake when you're developing the rules, because you can always recover it through the console. Uh, if you do it on a real system where you may not have direct access to the console, like for example a cloud service it's very easy uh, actually uh, to be fair cloud services by and large will allow you that they, they they often have a browser interface which allows you to connect to the console for a device but it can be a pain uh, worse still uh, if you're uh, you know joe blow making changes you may have to make special requests to get access to the console or ask somebody else to do it that can be really embarrassing um, the other thing is that sometimes if a machine's buried away in a data center you might not have physical access to the console through the data center uh, and you know you have to then ask operations or whoever uh, is in the data center to wander along pull out a tray physically connect to the machine uh, sort out your mess uh, so it's probably best on the whole to not screw things up uh, for, for my part you know I've got a, a couple of machines in the in, in another room it's a monumental pain in the arse if I make a mistake on the file and cut myself off because I then have to go in there drag out the monitor and the keyboard and plug them in and get the console up and running and sort the problem out again not the end of the world but you, you want to be careful about changing these to uh, global drop unless you're really sure that you've got a rule in there which is going to allow you to keep connected and on on our servers generally speaking that means keeping the ssh port open okay uh, i'm going to call it a day uh, in the next session which at the moment will be on wednesday or well, i might do it tomorrow we will start actually uh, entering the rules in this in the input table I'm, I'm going to keep the input table because why not uh, 
we'll, we'll start entering the rules uh, on the input table and showing how that works. Uh, and we'll, we'll set up the rules that we want uh, in order to preserve these connections uh, while at the same time making sure that uh, we cut everything else out. Uh, and like most things, in particularly in the security world, the general rule should be allow nothing unless you have to. Uh, uh, it's a bit like the general kind of rule when you're um, uh, when you're when you're developing anything. Uh, you know, if you if you make sure that you don't allow things by default, then it means that you only allow things which are actually essential and that that reduces you the the attack surface for anybody trying to break in it's a it's a common mistake for people to open up ports and you know, allow programs to connect to ports and stuff like that uh, without thinking about the downstream consequences and it's very easy particularly when you're developing stuff um to to get lazy <laughs> uh, developers and I speak from personal experience, you know, uh, as both a developer and one who has dealt with the consequences of this. Um, it's very easy to say, oh, you know, while I'm doing this, I'll, I'll just open up everything because it's just a development machine. The problem is you then transfer that system into an operations environment and the security people say, oh, ixnay on the opnay. And that, that everything's shut down and tight as a drum, and all of a sudden all your software stops working uh, because you know you've made assumptions about what would and wouldn't be allowed open. Uh, so it's best to start with the production attitude of nothing is open, uh, and then you have to make the relevant changes to allow just the bits you want. And when when you start dealing with production environments, it gets even worse because. Not only will you have, like this, a packet firewall, you, you'll probably have uh, application firewalls. Uh, bits of software that will sit and look at all the traffic passing in through a system and making decisions before they get to your application. Uh, uh, you know, there are sort of deep packet inspections where uh, you get things like, um, well, I will uh, strip the SSL certificate off this. Uh, this is for internal network traffic. I'll strip the SSL certificate and I'll actually look at the content. If the content doesn't conform to the rules, for example, isn't an XML packet, uh, then I, it just gets rejected or it gets you know, logged and rejected. Uh, uh, so again, it's just another layer of, of uh, protection for your system. Before it even gets your application, you can find that your stuff's being disconnected. The problem is that these rules will be draconian usually in, in the operation side of things, in the production side of things. And if you as a developer kind of just throw all that out of the window while you're developing in the interests of speed, the problem is when you get to the point where you're trying to deploy your system, you will find all sorts of shit will go wrong where uh, communication is, is broken. And this gets worse when you're dealing with things like microservice architectures, where the assumption is that stuff is going to tra uh, tra tra traverse the network. Uh, you know, it's kind of fundamental. And so then you get this horrible situation where, and, and I have to say, uh, most places that I've ever uh, operated, Ultimately, although the security teams will try their best to keep everything locked down, ultimately you end up with a very you know, relaxed set of rules quite a lot um, through the system. Uh, and although the, there, are, there are sort of gross rules saying, oh, this bit of the system, uh, this bit of the network can't communicate with that bit of the network, okay. Uh, rules about things like, you know, application folders, they tend to get very relaxed over time out of expedience yeah so when you reach the crunch on a project uh, the number of times i've seen it happen where because the planning didn't anticipate the deployment part into operations 
uh, because the deployment didn't anticipate that, the project's gone along and everybody's gone, oh, we're making good progress, we're making good progress, we're, we're going to be releasing. And then you get to the release point and, oh, God, what a mess. Yeah, because <coughs> senior management will suddenly turn around and sort of say, oh, you know, we've got to get this thing deployed because we've got a contractual obligation to have it deployed on day X. And this is worse when you're, you know, when you're talking about, you know, uh, service provision uh, online, because there you, you tend to have, this is when it's going to be delivered, and there's no chance of slipping that date. It's a service that you're trying to support. And what happens is uh, they will say things, yeah, yeah, they will put pressure then onto the operation side and say, look, you're holding up the entire project by insisting on, you know, having these rules in place. We'll, we'll just get it into production, get it working, and then we'll worry about, you know, closing it down. As soon as you hear that kind of thing, you know it's time to be polishing your CV because it's it's a dog shit way of doing things. Okay, it's completely the wrong way. Yeah? As soon as you have the attitude of let's just get it into production and get it working, and then we'll worry about securing it. Uh, you know, you can almost you can almost start writing the news article of you know when. You know when something's going to go tits up and there's going to be a data leak and or hackers are going to break in it's it at that point it's a question of when not if um and unfortunately that is extremely common uh, projects tend to do a lot of project burn and then they get to the release date and they uh, the pressure is entirely then on the operations team making allowances for deficiencies in the earlier part of the project deployment uh, and you know, especially things like firewalls, application firewalls, and, and so on. Uh, that's where compromises start to be made, and that's where you end up with systems where the, you know the security's relaxed. Uh, and well, you, you might as well put the bloody welcome mat out. Uh, yeah, uh, I would be willing to bet 90 percent of the big. Uh, data leaks that aren't a consequence of an internal employee, which admittedly is a lot. Uh, but the ones that are a consequence of break-ins um, and, and things, most of it will come down to project delivery crunch, uh, where you know senior managers will have made decisions about, you know, fuck it, get it working. Uh, I, uh, probably against the advice of engineers who, who have said, no, no, you know, we need to keep it secure. It, internal network security, even bloody worse, okay, because there's this feeling that if your board security is okay, then you don't need to worry about the internal network, which, of course, is complete cobblers, because uh, the problem then is you get one intrusion into some, you know, low level. I mean, this is the classic, you know, IT movie scenario unfortunately it's true in real life you know you get somebody come in through some small part of your system uh, that is interfaced to the outside world if you haven't got good internal network security uh, they can quickly pivot from one system to another and you've got yourself a big data breach that you never intended you know so Having you know internal firewalls and having inter and making the rules strict about what data is allowed to travel across what parts of the network and, and so on um, is just as important internally as it is on the on the external interfaces. Uh, but anyway, we'll, we'll cover all of that when we start talking next time about uh, securing our system.